Welcome, everybody. Thanks for joining us at the Advancing the Biden Administration's Racial Equity Priority Sessions. Um, I have the pleasure to be joined today by Candace Moore, the Chief Equity Officer from the City of Chicago, and Jamal Watkins, the Senior VP of Strategy and Advancement for the NAACP. Um, I myself am Clinton Johnson, and, our, and my pronouns are he, him, and his, and, and I'm the Racial Equity Lead for, for ESRI. Unfortunately, Charles Lee, the senior policy advisor for the environmental um, for environmental justice at the EPA, wasn't able to make it due to an emergency. But we're looking forward to having a really robust and exciting conversation with you folks today. And this session um, exists within the context of other diversity, equity, inclusion, and in particular racial justice focused events um, at the Fed this year. Monday, there was a session focused on racial equity, well, it's just a breakout session in particular focused on racial equity and social justice in the context of the federal agency space. Um, Charles was able to make that conversation and, and um, there was a robust conversation with a lot of your peers, maybe some of you were there. Uh, yesterday, we had a couple of sessions that focused on diversity and inclusion in the, in the GIS community, the North Star and Blacks in GIS event, where we talked about careers and leadership in GIS and, and, a, and an event in the afternoon, creating inclusive spaces for women of color in, in GIS technology, where um, lots of women share their experiences and opportunities and challenges and, and successes in pursuing, pursuing their career through GIS. And today, we're here having this conversation about how GIS and collaboration between um, government, nonprofit, and other sectors can help support your efforts to advance the Biden administration's racial equity related priorities. And later on this afternoon, there'll be another session on gender inclusiveness um, from, the, from the framing of the United Nations, where the, the focus there is to look internationally at, at ways to advance um, um, women's rights. So quick overview, um, I'm gonna quickly try to walk through um, you know, how GIS can be used as a framework in a sense to address the racial equity priorities for the federal government administration. And I wanna quickly get to a point where, where you all have, have a chance to, to meet virtually. Um, Candace and Jamal, I think they have really powerful stories and so they're gonna share a bit about themselves. And then we're gonna have a moderated conversation where we talk about the the, the um, what's being done today and what are the opportunities in the future uh, when it comes to mapping and analyzing racial equity, uh, using GIS to really operationalize racial equity and to um, connect with folks to address their enterprise-wide challenges with, with um, advancing equity. And then we'll have a, a Q&A period where you all get to ask some questions. But I would say, um, feel free to start tossing questions into um, um, out there um, already, and we'll start looking at some of that stuff and, and get things um, ready for later on. So people all, all across the country are just trying to live healthy and successful lives. Communities are trying to make the best of their local resources. Families are trying to provide strong foundations for prosperity and health of their children, and kids are just trying to live and grow up. Yet far too many are plagued by a wide and growing range of inequities across a broad, broad spectrum of topics. Uh, some, some communities are dealing with underfunded schools, yet over-policing. Some families are dealing with intergenerational economic hardships, yet underemployment. And far too many children are growing up with limited access to tech, yet overexposure to toxins. And there are many individuals, communities, and organizations that are working to understand and to unravel these racial injustices. In fact, many cities, counties, and some states have even declared racism as a public health crisis. And, and many, many commercial organizations are stepping up to do their part, recognizing that racial injustice is really everybody's problem to address. And in, in most cases, um, folks are committed to driving that change through cross-sector partnerships, particularly with folks in the nonprofit space. And as we are standing up to do our part, to help each and every one of you leverage the, the power of geographic and holistic thinking to increase understanding and ultimately to create solutions that bring an end to these longstanding injustices. And the Biden-Harris administration is also stepping up to lead, making racial equity a priority, and in many ways recognizing that racial equity and social justice has a role to play across the board. They released a potentially game-changing executive order that calls for the identification of methods to assess equity. Um, it tasks federal agencies with conducting equity assessments 
It seeks to advance fairness and opportunity through equitable allocation of resources. It promotes equitable delivery of benefits and opportunities. Um, it recognizes the need for increased engagement and with underserved communities in particular. And the order also calls for the establishment of an equitable data working group to help track these issues. And you know what? GIS can really help. You can use GIS to map and analyze inequities, to reveal and understand patterns of equity and, 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 and inequity, sorry. Uh, like how this map of PPE loans shows you know, where, this, where you see the circles that indicates the percent population, um, uh, the percent of the population of that community that's white. And in this example, the redder areas are those that have more loans and the bluer areas are those that have fewer loans. So at a glance, you can see that the redder areas tend to correspond with wider communities. You can also use GIS to apply a robust intersectional racial equity lens that addresses the social groups that are in focus in the executive order, including race, ethnicity, religion, language, uh, country of origin, sexual orientation, gender, and, and all the, the sort of um, characteristics that get at class. You can use GIS to go deeper, to understand the barriers to equity and also identify healthy patterns. This, this map takes the other map and goes a little bit deeper and looks at the outliers. So by looking at the outliers, you can address those inequities more intimately and also identify and uplift and then promote those, whatever decisions and practices that are leading to more equity. You can also apply the entire racial equity workflow to ensure more equitable delivery of services across the board. And at the core of that is constituent engagement. So you can use GIS to increase engagement by using racial equity focused hubs um, that, that really keep the conversation aligned to key initiatives, al allowing you to engage communities using surveys to collect sentiment demographics and location information to help drive change. And you can use story maps to share a complete narrative to walk through those decisions and practices that lead to the community conditions and assets that lead to disparities in community outcomes. And of course, there's a lot of rich data available in the Living Atlas and the and Esri's um, Maps for Public Policy that can help empower the data working group to, to drive change. And for those organizations that, that, that need to, to apply racial equity and social justice across the entire enterprise, including the growing list of racial equity leads, um, there's a lot of resources available to help facilitate the understanding of priorities, of impact and scope, in a structured way aligned with best practices for, for developing racial equity action plans, integrated with best practices for, for GIS so that you all can create geospatial strategies that, uh, that help your leaders orchestrate the delivery of geospatial capabilities to drive the racial equity um, uh, initiatives that you need to throughout your and throughout your, your organizations. And so all of this is a part of Esri's really comprehensive GIS and loca location intelligence resources that help support a broad range of, of racial equity and social justice initiatives. And all of this is really derived from the work that you, you all are doing, folks like Candace and Jamal is doing, and all we've done is sort of a set, is identified the patterns and infused all of that with GIS. And we intend to continue to grow and evolve these capabilities as your needs grow. So now, hopefully that was quick enough and I wanna, I wanna get you all introduced to, to our, our great panelists today. And so we'll get started with, um, with Candace. So now we're gonna go through all those technical things where I'll clumsily stop sharing and give her the ability to share. All right, just getting set up real quick here. Um, good to be with everyone. And am I all good? All right. Um, thank you so much. Uh, my name is Candace Moore, and I serve as the Chief Equity Officer uh, here in the city of Chicago. Um, I work in the mayor, the mayoral administration of Mayor uh, Lori Lightfoot. And uh, my role is new to Chicago, new to this administration, and I'm charged with building a new office 
uh, called the Office of Equity and Racial Justice. Um, uh, the way I like to sort of talk about our mission is that at, at the end of the day, what I'm trying to do is operationalize equity into how we do business as a city. So uh, really lifting up the, 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 the fact and the belief that racial equity is not a place you go to the office to get a little bit of that like sprinkled on your work. Um, instead, we've got to build it into uh, how we do our business day in and day out uh, in the city of Chicago. And that's, uh, that's institutional change, that's organizational change, that's culture change. Um, and so uh, it's a big job. And, and one of the things I ground myself in is as the first uh, chief equity officer, um, I'm laying a foundation. A lot of my work um, for, our, for our really as long as I, I'll be in this position is about laying a foundation. There will be chief equity officers. If I do my job right, there will be chief equity officers that come after me. And I think they may have different ways they might look at their work, but um, I really sort of center myself in what does it take to build that foundation. And um, it is from that question that um, we built up a strategy um, that we call Together We Heal. Um, I, I really think I connect to what Clinton laid out in terms of how do you engage community around a strategic uh, institutional change process is sort of a, a fundamental question. And how do you engage community in this moment? in this moment of racial reckoning, in this moment in which there, it, there are so much about our communities that are changing rapidly underneath us um, as we deal with COVID, as we deal with the changing world. So how do we think about the change that's needed uh, right now? And so Together We Heal is a multi-pronged strategic plan that um, my office put together that says, first, we need to think about how do we support healing in communities? Two, second, how do we think about leading public and collective reckoning? And three, how do we own institutional transformation? Um, and what I wanna share with you all today is how tools around um, geospatial, geospatial tools and the partnership that we've been able to do with um, Esri have allowed us and supported some of that work that we've been able to, been able to execute. So the first part of what we did here in the city um, is we launched a community challenge around racial healing. And part of that was coming from the fact that so many of our communities were uh, already doing the work of, he of healing in their, in their neighborhoods, um, in their networks. Uh, we were learning about peace circles that folks were doing, but we were also hearing people say, man, I don't see what's happening around the city. I feel like we're the only ones doing it alone. You know, can the city be a partner with us on this? Who else do you know is doing the work? And so in listening to the feedback that I was getting from community members, uh, we saw, thought it would be really important to actually create a, a community opportunity for all of us to sort of step into this space and to ultimately see the work, to see that this work is bigger than any individual neighborhood, any individual network, and that this is connected. And that energy and this culture change needs to happen, needs to be nurtured. Um, if we really want to be successful at policy change, if we really want to be successful at institutional change, um, culture change is, is key to that. Um, and so in our community challenge, we, we set it out for December, um, at the, December of last year through, uh, Mar uh, through March of this year. And we asked people to organize a healing event um, or, or activity with their family, friends, neighborhoods, coworkers, however they do it. And we left it broad because we know there are many different ways people do the work, um, but we wanna see it. We want you to be able to share it with us. We, we want you to literally put it on a map so that we can see it. Um, and then we want to create that map in such a way in which other folks across our communities can explore and can see and can connect around that. And so we were really grateful to be able to utilize a tool that um, as we had developed uh, and, and that our department of, um, uh, of technology worked with to build a, literally a virtual map. Um, I joke sometimes and say that I came to the team with, I just had a vision. I didn't know how it was gonna get done. I said, I want a map where people can show this work that's happening across the city. We can watch the map grow, we can experience it. Can you make it happen? 
And um, much to my both delight and surprise, it was we were able to make it happen. And so we built this, um, what we call the Together We Heal healing map. And as you can see so far over, there have been over 200 events recorded that represent um, about 8,500 people across the city of Chicago. And I know there's much more work being done, but this is the work that we are sharing. And so what is um, fascinating about it, interesting about it is that I can see in different neighborhoods, you know, where conversations are happening. What is the work? People are telling us about who they are, what they learn from their event so that we can actually connect and believe and see that this work is bigger than the, the, the space that we may be sitting in, especially in a time in which we are so isolated, that connected, that connectivity, that sense of, 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 of community is just really essential. And so this has been, um, you know, sort of part one of building that momentum, building that culture. And it's from these conversations and, you know, trust me, I got the feedback of Candace, this is just a conversation, where is this all going? And I think the beauty of this is that if you begin to build a culture, uh, a culture in which people are connecting, asking questions, uh, building with one another, that culture begins to create an environment in which you can now, you can build plans and you can build ideas and you can ask critical and collective questions that build into the momentum of the work. And, and so that's how we've been thinking about this. And in fact, we had a summit at the end of January, which was a convening moment. It was a convening moment to uh, show that, you know, our leaders actually need to be in conversation. So we actually had a conversation uh, directly between the mayor and the governor, a very candid, this isn't a policy conversation. This is you as leaders are also experiencing this moment that we are in. How, what are you holding? What are, how are you thinking about this? And, 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 you know, what I, the feedback that we got is how powerful it is. You never get to see from your leaders have a very sort of human conversation about what, they, what they're going through and what they see and how they're thinking about their work. Um, we also lifted up uh, work that we're, we're doing in the city around uh, memorials and monuments and folded that into this uh, a summit. But beyond just a presentation, the summit was also an opportunity for us to engage collectively around a conversation of what is equity? How are we going to define this? And what is a road ahead? What, you know, what more do we need to be doing when we think about healing? And so again, we were able to utilize a tool, um, the experience builder uh, that Clinton was speaking about to create a, a sort of a sentiment survey to understand how do Chicagoans, um, what is their vision for racial healing? And so this was an opportunity for folks to fill in a survey that took just a couple of minutes, but not only mapped it out, created a word map where you could see the sentiments that folks were expressing. And I could zoom in by different areas of the city. So in Chicago, our, our communities are, are really um, uh, racialized and segregated. So I know if I go to the South side, I'm kind of looking at what does the black community on the South side say about what their vision for racial healing is? What does the North side um, um, say? What does the West Side say? Um, and, and so you can. So what I what I loved about this is not only was it giving us critical data that we are still using on the back end to guide our decisions, but it was also giving something back to the individual that filled it out pretty immediately. They could begin to see how what they were offering was contributing to a, a much more collective um, a body of work, uh, and see what other folks are, are are saying across our city. And so. Where is that going? What are we planning to do with it? Um, in our path forward here, we are looking to build out an equity statement of principles, with something that really grounds uh, how we define equity in the city of Chicago and build out a year of healing. Um, some next steps that people are lifting up that would be really powerful to continue to move that culture and build the work. Um, and, and I'll just quickly say, Ultimately, we want this to feed into that second pillar that we've developed, leading public and collective reckoning. And we have a great opportunity in that our city is building um, a comprehensive plan right now that we call We Will Chicago. And part of the things that, some of the things that are needed for that plan are uh, a definition of equity and resiliency. And so that statement of principles that we're gonna build out, the goal is to integrate it into this citywide plan that is gonna guide how, how we think about development in our city for years to come. So that we're actually taking this culture work and actually embedding it, institutionalizing it into the policies and practices that will guide and shape the work um, beyond a, this particular moment. 
in addition, we're also really, uh, uh, we've been focusing and a lot of my work has been focusing on um, really working inside of our departments uh, to operationalize equity, to set goals. So we, uh, we created a network of liaisons across all of our departments and agencies to actually build and add capacity of individuals inside those agencies to be able to operationalize racial equity and build teams within their departments. We do staff training and support, uh, providing tools, access to information, all things where I think some of the things that Clinton was lifting up around some of the ESRI tools can be really powerful because the thing that we have to understand about equity work is that um, I, I, I joke sometimes and say, not everybody was born woke. Uh, you know, there, there is capacity building work that we must do. There are things that we have to understand. Um, there, there are things that all of us need to learn and understand about the impact of decisions, the historical um, impacts that, that still exist and have implications on our work. And so being able to build a space where you can uh, add capacity and build capacity with, uh, with, um, with uh, your, your teams and with the enterprise is so important. Um, and then, uh, you know, being accountable by setting out dashboards that really sort of show if you're making progress, um, how that progress is impacting the, the, the communities around you. So these are some of the ways in which we have really uh, benefited from the partnership of some of these tools and how some of these things have really supported us on taking it from just, you know, how do you think about culture and community and really drive that up into and through into the institutional work that, that we ultimately want to be able to execute on. And I'll stop there. Thanks, Candice. Um, and now I'll, I'll hand things over to Jamal so he can share a bit about his own journey um, before we before we get into a lively discussion with these two great people. Thank you, Clinton. I am really excited about the space that we're in in regards to this discussion and grateful to the team at Esri, Margo and others behind the scenes for really making sure that we're having a robust dialogue. Um, you all have heard the, sage, the stage being set by Clinton. You just heard from Chief Moore, who represents a city that I adore, Mayor Lightfoot and the great state of Illinois. My name is Jamal Watkins and I proudly serve as the SVP of strategy and advancement for the NAACP. And in this moment, I bring you greetings on behalf of our organization, um, President and CEO Derek Johnson, but more importantly, our almost 3 million members, advocates and activists who live and work in in community and roughly 2.4 million of those folks who are also active online. Now what's interesting about narration and the journey that we're on is I will lift up when I think about our association, we are housed in, in many ways geographically. And so when we think about our footprint, we are in 47 states where we have a true field presence. Now we have members in all 50 states and the District of Columbia, but when you look at North Dakota, South Dakota, Wyoming, not as many of us there. But what's important about this is that we're able to track this data and we've mapped it on the platform using you know, ArcGIS. And that allows for us to really talk about and know what our capacity is in terms of density and in terms of reach. What's also exciting about this sort of perspective when we think about how we look at who we are in terms of our followers online and who we have in community is we've done this same mapping with our partner organizations. So think Urban League, think National Congress of American Indians, Unidos US, the fraternities and sororities that make up the Divine Nine. We have done this effort to really map where they have a footprint, who their members are, because that is how you end up connecting the dots around the capacity in order to do community work with the issues that we care about. In fact, I was fascinated a couple of years ago when we started this journey, we worked with the National Baptist Convention in mapping their church organizations, I think 7.5 million members, thousands of churches. But when we looked at Georgia, the National Baptist Convention had at least two to three churches in every single county in the state of Georgia. Now, why does that matter when you fast forward to what we just experienced in 2020? voter registration, voter turnout in the black community. They literally were in every pocket 
of the state of Georgia, and then were able to mobilize their base and their churches in order to do that type of outreach. And so as we think about the numbers of our organizations, the NAACP's philosophy is very simple. Our theory of the case is rooted in people plus data equaling advancement. In a limited resource environment, we understand that you know, we don't have unlimited options. And so we have to look at things through a very strategic lens. And so us knowing that we're rooted in community, then taking the data that helps shape what we decide to do and focus in on in terms of policy advocacy really allows for us to move a winning agenda, agenda in the right way. Our president and CEO, Derek Johnson, has literally been on the forefront of advocating that the goal for us year in and year out is to develop clear outcomes. And as an organization that advocates for public policy, this is not about us doing work that makes us feel good, but about doing work that makes life better for the Black community, the communities we serve, and ultimately the nation. Now, in terms of a framework, which I think is important to step back, and this will mirror what you heard from Chief Moore, what you've heard from Clinton, is we want to track data. We have to show what the data looks like in terms of the, the maps that we produce, because in many ways, we're geospatially organized. You live and work in a certain environment, and then those impacts actually are community-centric. And then how do we identify the solutions, especially the policy solutions that actually close the gaps and make life better for the communities we serve? And then it allows for us to empower advocates and activists to move an agenda by mobilizing those community members. So going from theory to sort of a deeper example, we face a lot of inequalities in this nation and there's a lot of ways to slice it and you can talk about it in different ways. So for example, yesterday we were on with some education advocates and they're concerned about children, especially children of color, not having internet access at home. Why does that matter? Because it's COVID-19, folks are distance learning, parents have to actually be at home with their children in order for them to get education. But when you start to map it, you start to see that there are technology gaps in underserved communities, communities of color, the black community. And what this ends up being, for example, in a positive way, is you had the city of Boston. They were able to map families that didn't have technology and were able to give out 20,000 plus MacBooks and actually give vouchers for Wi-Fi service so that those families could actually have access to get e-learning and distance learning given COVID-19. And so the, the whole process of tracking the data, mapping the data, finding a solution, and then acting on that solution is realized. And you can apply this in many different segments of our work and our advocacy. I would argue that when we think about our strategic imperatives, it's not just about you know, a one size fit all. And so as we think about the interface with the federal government, the White House, the administration, we're looking at a lot of buckets and I'll lift up a few of them. For example, we all care about environmental justice and what it means to right-size environmental impacts. When you talk about the Flint water crisis, Flint is not the only city that's facing an issue with issues around clean water and budgets that are gonna lead to austerity principles that may result in clean water not being accessible for all. Think, you know, there's cities like Pittsburgh, I know that are struggling and looming with this, Newark, New Jersey and others. When you think about brownfield remediation, we know there are 500,000 sites around the country. Where are they? If we can map them, then I guarantee you when you start to do the overlay of race and ethnicity, economics, you start to see that certain communities are closer to these brownfields than others. When you think about the notion of transportation, we all know that transportation equity is key when it comes to connecting to job centers and food centers and other resources. You can map that to see what populations are segmented and separated from adequate transportation and which ones aren't and how to fill in the gaps. And the list goes on and on as we think about how to continue to connect the dots around the strategic imperatives in order to leverage the mapping in order to tell the story so that we get the advocacy right. Now, our desired impacts are rooted in change. So we don't do this just to map. When you think about driving economic growth, improving environmental outcomes, reducing health disparities, increasing quality education, achieving smart criminal justice reforms and others, mapping is crucial. In fact, tomorrow, the NAACP in partnership with Team Esri and other anchor organizations that are part of the Kellogg Foundation Racial Equity Partners, Urban League, Unidos US, Demos, um, Advancement Project, Love Judith Brown Dianis, 
we're launching a survey where we're going to be mapping policing budgets. And so um, Chief Moore, I believe the city of Chicago is on that list because we want to help community members you know, know where the money resides as it relates to then making decisions around investments. So for example, we've heard debates around school police versus school nurses. And so wouldn't it be wonderful for community members to know how much is being spent on having healthcare professionals in schools versus police in schools? And that's not to demonize one or the other, but to make critical decisions. The mapping helps us tell the story. And in the end, when we think about this notion of what it means for us to engage with the federal government, government agencies, cities, municipalities, we are clear at the NAACP that it's about things like expanding direct spending, increasing grant services to non-federal entities, creating new types of federal support programs, loans, et cetera, especially for communities and also municipalities that need improvements and thinking about tax preferences. And so this is just a snapshot of some of the ways in which we think about going from mapping the data, telling the story, connecting it to policy advocacy, to mobilizing our community around solutions that work for everyone. So I'm excited to be in this space. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and turn it back over to you, Clinton. Thanks, Jamal. I lost my mouse and things for a second. Uh, I'll share again, um, just for a moment. Terrible at this, what's happening, sorry. Okay. <laughs> so we heard um, Chief Moore talk about setting the foundation for long-term, for the long-term paving the way for the future um, of equity leads to come in Chicago, operationalizing equity and to support healing and, and leading a, a public reckoning, um, how, how they are supporting and enabling a culture of engagement and to grow trust and to lead change and the ways that Chicago used maps to facilitate engagement um, and to help others uh, become a part of driving change in a collective way. And, you know, really talking about the critical role that data plays and all of that, ultimately um, understanding that they are moving towards that public reckoning um, and impacting policies and practices long term and, and ultimately operationalizing equity across city departments. And we heard we 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 heard Jamal talk about how um, people plus data leads to advancement. Um, the need to be rooted in community and understand the relevance of where their team and their partners are located, realizing that they are geographically organized and there's an, there's an importance to that irrelevance. The need to track and map data to reflect and drive the work um, that, they did to the, that they do to deliver resources to folks in need. Um, the potential for, for mapping inequities um, and access to things like clean water, transportation, and so much more, all to support their efforts to effectively advocate for change. Um, and, and I really like the, the, the notion of the need to go from mapping to mobilizing. I think that's really important. Um, and so, so now I, I'm just excited to get into this conversation so all of you can, can learn from, from these two uh, amazing people. So that conversation is going to start with um, you know, all of the, the opportunities that exist to map and analyze racial inequity. We're gonna, you know, talk about the, the importance of location in the context of root cause analysis. Um, and, and, I, and I definitely wanna get at, uh, you know, give you all some, some tips, maybe get you some tips from these folks and, and how you can um, implement some of those equity impact assessments that you all have to do. So, so, so real quick, um, Candace, can you can you talk to us about the importance of applying an intersectional racial equity lens in the work that you do to drive change? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think you know the way I think about it. I, so when I when I started my office, I was very explicit that um, I wanted to lead with a racial equity lens. Um, I, I, I was um, clear that the name of the office should be the Office of Equity and Racial Justice. Um, and one of the ways I talk about it is that I'm explicit, I'm not exclusive. Um, I think if we don't understand the way that race plus gender creates a 
not just an added experience, but a unique experience, that, that intersection um, of, of identities and the ways in which histories and um, uh, societal positioning um, uh, come together create, can, can create a specific experience for a set of folks that is not the same or similar to uh, the, the general experience or even to experiences that they may have relative to one aspect of their identities. And so uh, in doing racial equity work, it is important to center and understand what those experiences are and what some of the most marginalized experiences are. And another, another frame that I use for the work is thinking about targeted universalism in a, in, in, in a lot of ways. If we can understand, if we can build uh, a solution or a strategy that can work for some of the most marginalized uh, groups that um, are experiencing our system, then oftentimes, not all the time, but oftentimes it actually provides a overall benefit um, um, uh, to, to whatever the overall effort is trying to do. So a good example uh, of this is how we've been thinking about some of our work around COVID. Um, you know, we had a, a, we had a real conversation and made an explicit choice that we needed to create a specific experience in terms of how we are getting vaccine and our strategies in our communities that we can see on a map have been furthest behind. These are the, I mean, day, you know, week in, week in and out, we've been looking at these communities and recognizing that, you know, infection rates as whatever we're doing across the city, for whatever reason, they just haven't been moving. You know, we've been executing X, Y, and Z. They just haven't been moving. And so by partnering with individuals on the ground to understand the experiences of what is happening, what are some of the dynamics that um, we're not accounting for? What are some of the unique circumstances? It's not just, you know, multi-generational family. It's a combination of multi-generational family, plus who has to go to work, plus who has access to healthcare, plus who has undocumented status, right? Like all of those things are coming and crashing together to have an overall outcome that um, individuals are not able to either access some of the support supports that we have or the services that we have. And so in knowing that, especially when we think about solutions like vaccines, the question is, what are we going to do about it? What are we going to do differently? What, what, now that we, we have more of an understanding of what is happening, how can we actually take that infrastructure that we use to learn and understand the problem and, and, and find and craft a solution in terms of bringing um, strategies there? And so I'm really excited about a body of work that we're doing right now around vaccine because one of our hardest and, and sort of uh, one of the communities that has, has suffered really from infection rates of COVID, th COVID throughout the pandemic right now is our fastest vaccinating community. And I think that is a testament to the power of that discipline of, of not only being there to understand the problem, but being committed to working with the community to, to find solutions. And, and I wanna jump in just to say what Chief Moore just lifted up is how pragmatic the data and mapping analysis can be for making policy decisions in the immediate. And coming from the state of California, I recall in the 90s, when there was a debate around whether or not you should collect racial data, there was a piece of legislation that was put forward by a man named Ward Connerly that said, we need to be race blind and not talk about race and ethnicity in our data collection. And the most powerful advocates that came out were folks who do cancer research because what the data showed is that when you think about breast cancer rates in California, the highest rates were in Marin County among white women. So without that racialized data, without that targeted data, how can you make the best decisions to unpack that phenomenon that was happening to that population in that county? When you fast track that type of analysis to what Chief Moore just lifted up around vaccinations, how do we make sure we're deploying those resources, vaccinations, vaccination trust information, resources to the communities that are hardest hit by COVID-19 without having the data. And then being able to map the data in a geospatial way to then show ultimately what the impacts would be, the turnaround story. So I love the fact that we are rooting this in things that are not theoretical, but pragmatic that ultimately make life better for the communities we serve. Yeah, I think that's a, 
that's a powerful point to add on. And and one thing real quick, um, Candice, before you jump back in, um, what was laced in there in terms of, you know, like the intersections were the obvious ones, income, you know, race, ethnicity, gender, um, also the need for new data or, or, or more fine grain data about like, it's not just about what the income is, but who's go, who has to go to work. Another like really natural intersection that's in there that you all are talking about when you mentioned California or the North or South side of Chicago is geography. So I think that's another like really important natural part of all this that sometimes um, gets taken for granted. I'm sorry, Candace, what, what were you gonna say? Yeah, and I just wanted to lift up uh, really quickly that, you know, I think sometimes in this work, people say, well, if you're doing all of that in one community, then you're not doing X, Y, and Z in other communities. And I just want to lift up how vaccinating that community fastest is actually working in service of the entire city. Because to me, COVID has really demonstrated that the mutuality of communities uh, I, I don't know how every city is organized, but the way we are organized in, in, in Chicago and Illinois is that we have phases. And if our positivity rates are at certain percentages, then we don't do like X, Y, Z is happening, closed down all things. And so if we can move the needle in those communities, that impacts dramatically our overall number. And so just that sense of mutuality that this is not just about sort of cherry picking. This is about a fundamental connectedness that we have that what is happening to that community over there is connected to what I experience, and I think that is a lesson that we've got to carry beyond this 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 moment of a pandemic and recognize that that is the muscle that we need for so much of the work that that we have ahead of us. Yeah, and a and a part of um of creating that kind of culture, uh, you know, creating that kind of culture change and and. And raising that level of awareness so people can see those con that those points of connectivity um, are uh, frankly a part of I think operationalizing racial equity that you lifted up, Candace. That that um, I'm not even sure I really thought about uh, you know in that way before. You know, like the, the, the I, you know I understand that we have to we have to teach GIS professionals um, that they they can't just go in the corner leverage what they learned from 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 school and from practice and and, and dig into data, um, you know, sort of on their own, just using their own expertise that, that there has to be a lot of engagement with the leaders um, in your organizations, with the folks in community to get that new data, that new insight, build trust, um, learn more about the, the details of these, the intricacies of the questions that need to be asked in order to drive change. But the reality that change management in a sense of culture shift is a huge part of that. And um, I, like how, how, what does it look like to to drive and create that kind of a of a culture shift across a collect a collective of partners that you go to go you know that you go into this work with? What does that look like, and how are you, how are you used in tech to enable that that kind of community building? And you want me to start? Yeah. Either either one of you can can go yeah. for that. I say I saw both mics went off. Here, Jamal, so I don't know if you want to start or have anything. No, so you go. I'll okay, follow. Okay. okay, perfect. Um, so, you know, one of the things that I did when we first started out is to try to kind of do some uh, mapping of, uh, uh, of, of leaders in the city and, and where departments were at and just sort of, you know, and, and I told them, I was like, this isn't a grade, this isn't a score. I just want to know where, you at, where you're at because if I don't know where you're at, I don't know what I need to provide to you. I don't know what, you know, I'm, I'm driving blind um, and I'm assuming that everybody is in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in the same state, which I think actually does a disservice to me. And so that, that, that initial just scan of asking some critical questions about what exposure people have already had to racial equity work, what, what when I say some of these words, what comes up for them, uh, what are some of the efforts that they see already. Um, one, it, it showed me a lot about uh, where they were at, but it also showed me some opportunities that I could tap into to strategically build equity as an add-in and not just an add-on, which, which is just a message I, I bring home day in and day out. This work has got to be an 
add in. This can't be an initiative that you just slap on top of something or a policy that is that is met that stands completely uh, unintegrated with anything else. This has got to be connected and integrated. We've got to think about equity right into the business of the work. And so, and so in that though, I see that. Uh, there are a lot there. So definitely there's some folks who I call my woke folks, right? So they didn't read, they read all the books, they took all the courses, they got all the certific certifications, they um, are really deep in this work. And, uh, and so what I need to do with them is, is different. Right. Um, how I how I activate them, how I uh, create champions for the work, how I support them in building the work. They, and then there's a good amount of folks who um, are are want to do it, don't know how, haven't been quite exposed. And I think there's an important opportunity to build capacity by just actually like teaching, connecting, um, um, uh, bringing tools, bringing strategies. Um, and then there are folks that are more resistant, for sure. And they're resistant for different reasons, though. Um, and so really understanding and dissecting that. But what I find is that across the entire sort of enterprise, um, there, we can actually build a culture of learning, a culture of curiosity, a culture of innovation. Much of the things that we learn about what it takes to do organiz organization change, um, when we think about resiliency frameworks, when we think about innovations, I think much of that can that muscle can be applied to equity work. A lot of times I say my work is innovation work, my work is resiliency work. What we are what the the, the explicit part of the work is that we are going to have honest conversations about race. We are going to ask the questions. We are going to put it on the table. I'm going to support you in not being afraid to have the conversation about race because it is as real as anything else that we are looking at. And if we're not talking about it, then it's still happening. We are just not doing our part to, 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 to build the work and to try to address it. Racial equity work has got to be affirmative. And so the, the goal is to, is to really activate people in, 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 in engaging in that affirmative work. And you know, I would lean in, and I believe Keith Moore said something earlier that was really important, the mutuality of communities. And so as a national organization that's also hyper-local, we have had to really wrestle with not getting caught up in oppression Olympics. Every community you can go to has folks who are hurting in some way, who are struggling in some way. So how do you use the data and the mapping to unpack that? When we think about say policing budgets and police reform, the black community, and we, we map this and know this, has been over police and over police for years. When you get into the Latinx Latino community, policing has been over the last few years connected to immigration enforcement. And we're grateful, by the way, for Mayor Lightfoot from divorcing local law enforcement from ICE enforcement, that matters. But then you go into the native community, the tribal communities, they don't have enough resources for public safety. One issue continuum, but varied impacts. We all can work together to not only show what those impacts are, but then what are the solutions uniquely needed to make sure we're right-sizing law enforcement and public safety for the Latinx community, the Black community and tribal communities at the same time without fighting each other or tripping over one another. There's also this other reality of using the data to really highlight the depth of need. And so when we're talking about how to create a multicultural, multiracial collaboration around policy advocacy, sometimes it's just showing folks, hey, you live in a food desert. I live in a community that has 10 grocery stores, you have none. So let's work together to figure out how to get you a grocery store in your community and what that means. And I know our friends at the Kellogg Foundation who are dealing with food insecurity for vulnerable communities cares about that. And as we connect the dots, it allows for us to not talk about our racialized differences, but how we close the gaps on the disparities and needs that we have. And so when I think about data and mapping, it does help us to diffuse some of the divisions so that we can really talk about what we need and what solutions work to meet those needs. And be before we trans transition into questions, um, I, I think just from listening to that conversation and thinking about you know all the work that we've done with other organizations, um, and and the work that I've that I've done, um, you know, working at the city of Philadelphia for so many years, um, when I think I think think about things like city stat, um, crime stat, all the stats, 
when I think about performance management and, and, the, and, and when I compare that to the nuanced ways that you all are talking about um, these various intersections that, that, uh, that define the communities and, and, and help us to understand the, the variance and need even around a common topic, you know, one metric can't tell the story for um, how we're doing with policing, right? As you just described, Jamal, you need to intersect location and um, race and ethnicity and gender and all these other factors. So, so I, I want to sort of, uh, you know, take a moment to imagine, you know, what a Chicago looks like, what an NAACP looks like that has dashboards in front of leaders um, where they're looking at more than just one metric. They're looking at how, um, how, how each community around one topic is, is dealing with and experiencing um, services. You know, I, I would jump in here and say, and, and I know Chief's work can get into how this is affected at the city level, but when we think about people and people's lives, we are we intersect with a lot of inputs. We, you know, there's trap, there's transportation, there's healthcare. If you have children, there's education, there's housing. And so we think about issues that are affecting our communities. One of the things that the data allows for us to do is show causation and also connectivity. So I recall when I was working for Amnesty International, we started a project around maternal mortality. And there was a theory of the case that, hey, US, the US has it together, it's not that bad. But when you started to look under the hood, death rates for women of color and black women due to childbirth, was in fact, the death rates for black women in the US, even when you adjusted for education and income levels, was the same as in countries like Sierra Leone and Burkina Faso, who had way less infrastructure and poverty that was, you know, a hundred times what we saw here. And so in many ways, you had to start unpacking, why is that? Is it access to clinics? Is it access to culturally competent care? Is there something about education? And so you start to unpack it, we ended up finding there were 50 solutions that would actually right-size maternal mortality for Black women in the U.S., so that it wasn't in the crisis numbers we found. And that's a, a, a small example. You can apply that probably to any you know, sort of issue that there are layers of data and information. And we also found that certain cities had it worse off. And so when you start to unpack that, what were the cities doing that were succeeding versus the ones that were not so successful? And all of that matters in, our, in terms of finding the right policy solutions and the right even community mobilization around those policy solutions. So I would argue, Clinton, you know, we have to really be strategic and smart about how we look at data and look at mapping because it really is about meeting the needs of people at a fundamental level of where they live and where they where they choose to, to reside. And in some cases where they're forced to live because of socioeconomic status. And that really helps us, I think, you know, unpack a lot of the layering that it's not just a one issue sort of matrix, it's, it's multi-issues. Yeah, and I think I would just add, you know, as I think about the experience that I have working um, at the city level, um, and I'm imagining this sort of state that you you talked about, um, Clinton, in terms of like we have all these dashboards and all these inputs, and we can see all of these things. And at the end of the day, the work is still outside of that, right? The the work is still with people. And so one of the things I'm always stressing is that the numbers are critical, but we cannot forget the narratives, the things that write the story and the and the experience in between. You know. We'll, you know, whatever the numbers are, right? And, and how do you ultimately make sure that the wall is not up between uh, government or an institution and community such that you know everything, but community doesn't, right? Because the work has to be built inside and out and so a big thing I actually stress is that as we're building these dashboards, how do we how do we think about transparency as a value in that community ought to and deserves to know the same information that we are looking at. We need to come to the table and with a collective problem and say, okay, what can we do to build build around this? 
Um, and there are things that community can clearly see and make sense of the data that you, you and your colleagues would spend all day and still not come up with. I mean, this happens time and time again. I value this principle and I still sometimes find myself running into it, right? Where I'm saying, I was looking at this and they're like, Kansas, why don't you just go over here? Everybody in the community knows that that's the place you go to. And there's no amount of data that's going to tell me that, right? And so, so, so this powerful sense of like numbers and narratives coming together, I think can be deep ingredients to, to real tr fundamental transformation because we're not just trying to trans transform the outcome, we're also trying to transform the process. Um, and, and so it is, that, is a, that is what we need to do differently about how we come to these things if we really not only want to change this work, but we want to sustain and to transform this work. Yeah, that's that's really powerful. I, I want to transition to questions, but like that that's something that I always think about. Um, you know, the 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 power of maps and story maps to to be a a, a vehicle for for bringing narrative around whatever data we have, but then also taking that content, sharing it back out, so other people working in and around the same regions, working in and around the same topic, have access to it to 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 drive their own work. Now there's a bunch of questions coming in. One I want to raise up real quick for for you, Chief Chief Moore. Um, someone's asking if can if COVID-19 vaccination events and sites have been considered for inclusion in the TW in the Together We Heal map, um, and if there's enough uh, of vac of a vaccination plan in place to include that yet. Um, so they're not in the Together We Heal map. Uh, we do have tons of maps when it comes to our COVID um, outreach. One of the things that we've been doing as a city is that we, um, you know, our Department of Public Health and the team of epidemiologists really do track all sorts of, of data. And we, every week come together as a cross collaborative team around that data. So they give us a deep dive update. We talk about different strategies that we're employing and we learn a lot about what the impact is, uh, what the problems are, et cetera. So that, that's been a culture of practice. It is not tied to together we heal map, but um, there are lots of lessons, you know, there's even connectivity that I see in, as a person who sits in both places, or we're talking about listening to what community says, um, as well as looking at these maps. And, I, and I'll probably be frank that I think the discipline that I have at that table comes and carries over into how I then think about the discipline uh, of what I do at, at, at the community level and around to, um, Together We Heal. Now we do still make sure that the map mappings, you know, a big part of it has been making it available to the public. So we have public facing dashboards. Uh, like you could go from wherever you're at right now and go into our COVID dashboard and see what the infection rates and the vaccine rates are in, by zip code, by community area, broken down by race, broken down by gender. All of those things are publicly available and people are getting them almost as real time as we get them uh, uh, inside government. Thank you for that. Um, here's another comment and question. Uh, thank you for these conversations on interconnectedness. They reflect Adrian Moore, Adrian, sorry, Adrian Marie Brown's work on the emergent strategy. Do y'all have any resources you, you rely on, authors, mentors, when supporting a community, more non-structure as you tackle these initiatives with structured institutions? You know, I would start off from a place that, you know, we we love thought leaders and and folks who you know, are eloquently able to write books, but we also tend in our space to lean in on community leaders and advocates at the hyper-local level, and the marriage of those two matter. And so when I think about, you know, a book like New Jim Crow written by Michelle Alexander, I guarantee you there are activists in the west side and south, south side of Chicago who can actually tell you their lived experiences with criminal justice reform and criminal justice and how the reforms needed to happen, which then led to a commission that was created around torture that covered issues like in the West Side of Chicago. So I think for our organizations, we really try to connect the dots around an academic approach, but with a community-centric approach and bridging the two, because that's how we find the po policies and solutions that work for the people who are literally living in said impacted communities, white, black, brown, or indifferent. 
And yeah, I would totally second that. Um, I think it's, it is a marriage between the two. I'll just lift up uh, one thought leader that I, uh, I've learned a lot from uh, his, his writings and his academic studies, John Powell. Um, and particularly, uh, I, I really appreciate the work he did on his book, uh, Racing to Justice. So the way he thinks about uh, structural uh, racialization was a concept that I think really sort of grounded me in a lot of, in a lot of the work. I thought we would be able to get one more question in, um, but we are so close to the end I, I, that I want to—I don't want to leave out without um, taking the time to thank both of you for for engaging in this really important conversation. I, I really, I really hope that folks in the audience are able to to learn from some of the things you are doing, um, and the big part of that being this need to connect with the community and with other partners who are dealing with the same challenges. And I hope that there are ways that you all are getting connected with each other to help drive this work in a collective way. Um, I really love that that point that that I think we're we're, we're leaving off on that um you know there's a there's a there's a, a lofty idea about who is um, who has the right information who can help lead the way where to get that information um, but the reality is on the ground people have been doing this work day in day out they live and breathe it and they probably know more than any of us about the challenges that they face again just I want to just thank everybody for for showing up and participating today. Um, hope you all have a great rest of your conference and, and um, Jamal and Candace, hope you have a great rest of the day.